Good evening. Well, it's really a pleasure to uh, be in Minneapolis. I was supposed to be here a couple of weeks ago, but you had a little weather event that uh, kept me away, but I understand that happens on occasion here. Uh, I bring you greetings from New England, where we have our occasional weather events as well. Um, thank you very much, Rick, especially for putting this whole thing together, and Tim and, and the students just had a wonderful dinner with. I love spending time with students. I love spending time with young people. As Tim alluded to, I'm not a career academic, although I spent 30 years uh, in, in academics while I was doing my real work, uh, which was running international businesses at a pretty high level, uh, dealing with these issues of economics and globalization and capitalism and all of the things that are associated with that. And I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of global capitalism. And a few years ago, I was uh, asked uh, if I would uh, change things a little bit. I felt called to change things a little bit. Uh, and I extricated myself from the corporate world and went to uh, Oxford University where I taught not only in the business school but also taught theology. Uh, I'm not only a, a professor at Gordon-Conwell, I'm an alum of Gordon-Conwell as well. So it was a wonderful opportunity to bring these three worlds of mine, pastoral ministry, uh, economics and business, and, uh, and uh, academic theology together. And what I found was everybody should bring those things together. We were not created by God to live in silos. And I should have known this because I'm what is commonly referred to as a Kuyperian Calvinist. In other words, I take seriously when Kuyper said, there is not one square inch in all of creation over which Christ who is sovereign does not cry, mine. So this sacred secular divide that we find ourselves accustomed to is not biblical at all. So I want to share some of these thoughts with you. You raised a great question, Tim. You, you said, you know, what are the biblical issues as it comes to economics? And I think we have a couple of problems here. One problem is economic illiteracy. I suspect there are a lot of people within the sound of my voice who if I threw out some fancy economic terms, you might say, I don't know what that means. And you shouldn't be embarrassed by that because most people don't know what they mean. But actual economic literacy gets even deeper than that. In fact, most people don't even know where money comes from. Most people probably can't define capitalism, and I promise you they can't define socialism. So the economic illiteracy is one of the things I'm trying to combat. But we also have a problem of biblical illiteracy. Now, that is not unique to the United States. In fact, I want to share a true story with you uh, about biblical illiteracy in England. So in the UK, um, it's fashionable that if something is successful in the US, they import it into the UK. Some of the things they import are really good, like Thanksgiving has become really popular. Uh, American football has become really popular. Some of the things they bring over, I'm not so excited about. Halloween, not really a fan. They do it now in the UK. The other thing they've imported, which I think is a big mistake, is talk radio. Because we all know that the purpose of talk radio is to get people really riled up and excited so that they call and scream into the phone. Well, there was a talk radio show in London and the topic was homosexuality in the church. Now you can imagine what a tense discussion this was. You can imagine how animated people got arguing on both sides about the issue of homosexuality in the church. And this thing's going on for a while and finally this one poor old guy he called in East London accent, thick East London accent, and he was just fed up and he said, What's all this talk about them gay bishops in that? Jesus must be rolling over in his grave. <laughs> and I thought he's on our side. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so that's biblical illiteracy. It's a problem everywhere. So what I want to do is I want to unpack this whole question of redeeming capitalism by doing it in bite-sized pieces. Some of the questions I want to ask tonight is, what is capitalism? Is it redeemable? Does it need to be redeemed at all? And why do I use that term redeem? 
Well, I'll answer that question right now very quickly. I mentioned before that I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of global capitalism. I have personally participated in the good and the bad and the ugly of global capitalism. And I wrote the book because I reject a very common narrative. And this is a narrative of complacency, which suggests that the bad and the ugly is the price we have to pay for the good, and I reject that. So I tell people, if we don't redeem capitalism, we're going to hate what replaces it. So the question then becomes, does it deserve to be redeemed? Maybe we should just let it go, be on the on the ash heap of history. How did we get into a situation where in the United States of America we are seriously debating the virtual merits of capitalism versus socialism versus Marxism? And socialism and Marxism are not the same thing, and I'll talk a little about that, and it's important to understand the distinction. What are some of our options? Where is God in all of this. The most important question for people of faith is, where is God in all of this? And then ultimately, what's next? After we talk about these things, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? How are we going to take the conversation? Are there things we can do individually as churches, etc.? But I want to start by telling you what I call three tales from the crypt. Those of you old enough to remember that show, Tales from the Crypt, these are horror stories. But they're true stories. And hopefully these stories will help place into context my own experience and why I feel so strongly about this. When I was a young executive in the 1980s, just kind of coming into my own, I was one of those guys that had the yellow suspenders and the yellow tie, and boy, oh boy, I looked like I jumped out of the movie Wall Street. And I wanted to move up the corporate ladder. And it just so happens that I had an opportunity to win a huge account. It would have been one of the biggest, if not the biggest new account for my company that year, and I knew if I won that account, my career was set. Well, it just so happened that the company I was working for at the time had sponsored a PGA Tour senior event, and there were two places for customers to come and play with the pros. Now, that's a big, big sales opportunity. If you can get your customer to play golf with Lee Trevino or something, you got him, right? You, you own him. So I went to the COO of this company, the number two man in this multi-billion dollar global company. And I asked him if he would like to come and play golf in the pro-am with the pros. He said yes. I said yes. Fantastic. Now, what he didn't know is that I was a scratch golfer. What I didn't know is that he couldn't hit the ball out of his shadow. So we show up for this thing, and we've got time to play a nine-hole practice round, and I think to myself, oh my gosh, what have I done? This guy is going to be paired with a PGA Tour pro, and he can't hit the ball out of his own shadow. So I spent two hours teaching him how to play golf. That's all I had, two-hour window. I had to teach him how to play golf. It was like the old Jackie Gleason thing. Hello, ball. I mean, that, we, were, we were right at the basics. A weird thing happened in those two hours. A, I taught him how to play golf, at least enough that he didn't embarrass himself the next day. But actually, we became friends. Now, we shouldn't have become friends because I was this young, upstart neophyte okay, and in the pantheon of corporate gods, he was a demigod, and yet we're walking around. He goes, you know, you got to come to my club when we get back to New York. You got to bring your wife. Your wife and my wife will really hit it off. We got to play golf. We got to have dinner. Before you know it, I was his BFF, and here's what I found out. He wasn't just a really powerful and important guy. He was a really nice guy. The name of the company was Lehman Brothers that he was the number two man of. Let that sink in for a minute. Lehman Brothers. Why do I tell that story? I tell that story because I learned after the collapse of Lehman Brothers 
that the people who make the kinds of decisions that led to the global financial crisis aren't evil people. They don't have horns. They're just like you. They're just like me. They're nice people who love their families, love their kids, coach soccer, pay their taxes, contribute to the church, but they have been sucked into a vortex of global capitalism that has completely erased their moral compass to the point where they make decisions they don't even know are immoral while they're making them. That's the first tale from the crypt. It's important to understand that framework because these are nice people. The second one, fast forward a number of years, now I'm the guy in the corner office. Now I'm the big shot. And I'm running a division across Europe, Middle East, and Africa for an even bigger multi-billion dollar company, and we are doing great. Now, it happened to be in the middle of the dot-com boom. Remember the dot-com boom? Most of you probably remember it as the dot-com bust, but there was a boom before there was a bust. And one day, the vice chairman of my company flies over unannounced in the corporate jet, and he says to me, I need you to take $50 million in fixed costs out of your business this quarter. I said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> I said, do you have any idea how many people I'd have to lay off to make that happen? Why would you do that? We're already making 9.7% return on invested capital, and we're in basic materials. We're killing it. He said, I don't care what you have to do. Do it. Got back on the jet, went home. Now, I was a good corporate soldier. I got into that corner office because I did what I was told to do. But something didn't feel right. I couldn't understand why I was laying off hundreds of people, including people who've been with the company 25 years. Because those are the people who make the most money. You've got to get rid of them. So one day... I had to sit down across the table from one of the managers in our French division, 25 years of the company, and told him his services were no longer required. We both knew he would never work again because he was 54 years old. And in France, if you're laid off at 54, you don't ever work again. And I went home and I said to my wife, I don't know if I can do this anymore. This is soul-destroying. It's soul-destroying. I've had to reorganize companies. I've had to lay people off when there was an existential threat to the business. But when we were already making money hand over fist, why was I being asked to do that? Then I got my answer. When I went, read the company's annual report a few months later, I saw that that executive exercised two million share options. And if the price of the stock went up a buck, because of that move, he pocketed $2 million. It went up two bucks. And for purposes of full disclosure, I had options too. But I knew then that something was wrong. I knew that this system that I love so much, that I've given so much of my, my life to, which has done so much good in the world by creating wealth in an unprecedented way, there was something rotten at its core. There was something fundamentally flawed, not in capitalism itself, but in what capitalism had become, in the way we were doing capitalism. And that was the problem. That's what drove me to write the book. So here's a few things that I want to share with you that I learned in researching this book. First things first. If you don't remember anything else I say today, I want you to remember this. Capitalism is a subject, not an object. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Capitalism is a subject, not an object. Capitalism possesses no hypostasis for the theologians in the audience, no personality traits. There is no agency behind it, no mind, no will. No one directs it. It is not an artificial construct. No one invented it. You can't say this is the day that capitalism started. Cap
capitalism is just a term we use, actually coined by Karl Marx, ironically. But capitalism is just a term we use to describe this phenomenon of lightly regulated, highly monetized free markets. That's all it is. Now, the reason why that's important is because it isn't an object. It means it cannot and does not possess any moral uh, compass of its own. It will, in fact, reflect the morality and the ethics or the lack thereof of those cultures that employ capitalism for the purpose of wealth creation. Think about that for a minute. So you can't say capitalism is evil because capitalism doesn't have a mind. Capitalism doesn't think. There is no agency. If we think capitalism is evil, it means we are practicing it in a way that is evil. And if you think about it, that makes sense. You know why? Because every economic decision that's ever been made was a moral choice. Let me say that again. Every economic decision that's ever been made was a moral choice. The choice to buy this jacket instead of an Armani jacket was a moral choice, not just an economic choice, because it involves stewardship. So how we do capitalism is really, really important, but we have to accept responsibility. It means the capitalism we have is the capitalism we have chosen. And one of the things I found by doing global capitalism, everybody doesn't do it the way we do it. Capitalism looks very different in different parts of the world. So, if we want it to be redeemed, we're gonna have to make different choices. Simple as that. If we want to redeem it, we have to make different choices. Now, the term redeemed is a loaded term. Redemption simply means overcoming the effects of past sins. That's all redemption is. So if we acknowledge the sins of the recent past, we can redeem it by doing that which is necessary to overcome the effects of our bad decisions. And you know why I love speaking at colleges and universities and why I love teaching? Because I love being around young people. Because I gotta be honest, I think my generation didn't do a very good job with this. I see young people coming up and they're saying, look, we don't know what it's gonna look like, but we know we wanna do it differently from what your generation did. And that encourages me. And our generation, we have a responsibility to listen to the young people, not to just blow them off, Remember that when we think about socialism, Marxism, capitalism, we view it through the prism of the Cold War when we were facing existential threats and the whole world was very easy to understand. There was black and there was right. There was good and there was bad. There was Soviet, there was us. Good guys, bad guys. That's not their prism. That's not how they view the world. So we can't project onto them our prejudices from our past. Their consciousness about social things was formed at the depth of the global financial crisis. Why do you think then only 19% of millennials call themselves capitalists? And why do you think 58% of millennials believe they would rather be in a socialist system? Because they don't have the view some of us in this room have. So we've gotta be humble. We've gotta listen. We've gotta learn, because you know why? They're the generation that's going to have to fix the mess we created. And they're going to pick your nursing home. <laughs> so how do we get here? So in the book, I talk about three epics, E-P-O-C-H, three epics of capitalism. The first is what I call traditional capitalism. This is the capitalism of Adam Smith. How many people are familiar with Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations? Absolutely. How many people have actually read Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations? How many people know that you can't read or understand or appreciate Wealth of Nations if you haven't first read his previous work, Moral Sentiments? That's the key. Because you see, what most people don't realize is for most of history, at least since capitalism came on the scene in the 18th century, Economics was not a mathematical modeling science. It was a moral science. 
It was a moral science. Adam Smith was a moral philosopher. So we've all heard the famous quotes, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher and the baker and the brewer that we get our dinner, but from their self-interest. And everyone goes, ah, smoking gun. Capitalism is built on selfishness. No, it's not. Self-interest isn't selfishness. Self-interest is self-love. And the double love command presumes self-love. Selfishness is when you think of your own needs at the expense of the other. That's the sin of selfishness. But the fact that we look after our own needs, that's normal. And everything that Smith says about capitalism is predicated on his belief that it must be rooted in an Enlightenment version of Judeo-Christian principles. That's what Smith says. Smith says, no matter how wicked you think humankind is, in fact, it is endemic to the human condition that everyone be concerned about the welfare of their neighbor and the welfare of society. That's Adam Smith. That doesn't sound like the book of the Beijing, right? but people don't bother to read the whole Adam Smith. So when you think about capitalism in its embryonic state, in its traditional state, it was rooted deeply in Judeo-Christian ethics, in virtue, in wisdom, in faith, in hope, in love, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the teachings of the church fathers, in Calvinism, because remember he was Scottish. That's the original version of capitalism. And we forget about that. We forget about that. Why? Because over time, it began to morph. And because capitalism, as it was practiced in this country, was especially influenced by hyper-Calvinism and Puritanism and Neo-Puritanism and Kuyperian Calvinism. And that's what Max Weber called modern capitalism. Max Weber looked at all the capitalisms around the world and he said, how come the Americans do it better than everybody else? And here's what Max Weber found out in this so-called Protestant ethic. He said, this neo-Calvinist ethic that has been endemic to the American dream and the American experiment from the beginning is based on the belief that believers should order every aspect of their lives as worship to God. That there should be what he called a this-worldly asceticism, where you don't have a sacred-secular divide. You believe it's all sacred. And so in your work, you take literally the Apostle Paul when he says your work should be your worship. And then you also have this neo-puritanical revulsion toward pleasure-seeking. So what's going to happen if you have a whole country of people who are working like mad, creating wealth because they see that as an expression of their worship to God, but then don't use the wealth that they've created for personal pleasure or aggrandizement? What's going to happen to that wealth? It's going to go back into the system, and it's going to create more wealth. Or it's going to create some of the benevolent societies that we still benefit from today that go back to the 19th century. Those were the glory days, if you will, of modern capitalism. But Max Weber was quite prescient. Max Weber glimpsed into the future and he said, here's the problem. If America ever loses that ethic, the capitalism they've created will morph into something very dangerous because it will not be moored in virtue. And he was right. And that's the capitalism we have today. That's what I call postmodern capitalism. It is capitalism which is devoid of a moral compass and resistant, if not impervious, to ethical constraint. And one of the things that you will hear expressed by people is the so-called Friedman doctrine of corporate morality. Milt Friedman, the famous economist, 
whose economic policies were brilliant, but whose ethics were terrible, famously said that the only moral responsibility of a corporate executive is to make as much money as possible within the constraints of law and custom. Now, what's wrong with that ethic? Think about it for a minute. Make as much money as possible? Over what period of time, Dr. Friedman? You don't say that. We have seen that if your goal is to make as much money as possible over the shortest amount of time, you will likely make some very, very immoral decisions that could create an existential threat to the very business that you're supposed to be serving. But according to your ethic, that's okay because you don't talk about time. And, and what do you mean by moral custom? Which moral custom? Because we don't have religious hegemony anymore. So which moral custom are you talking about, Professor? And law? Law? Here's what I tell all my students. I hope you remember this too. If anyone thinks we can regulate and legislate ourselves out of postmodern capitalism, forget about it. And here's why. Regulation and legislation is what we default to when ethics fail. And we are always one generation behind the bad guys. Right? We always close the barn door after the horse is bolted. So therefore, we need a new ethic if we want a new capitalism. And here's the thing. It took a long time for us to get here, and there are no quick fixes. And this is the problem with those who promise utopia. And I'll talk about that in a minute and why the whole utopian thing is a problem. Because we have options. Was Karl Marx right? I have a whole chapter on Karl Marx. If you've never read Marx, I hope you buy the book just to read that chapter on Karl Marx. Because I think I'm fair to Marx. But I also think I expose the problem with Marx. And the problem with Marx and the problem with other forms of socialism and the problem with any closed economic system, whether it's presented by Thomas Piketty or anyone else, is that they miss understand what wealth is. If I went around the room and I said, what's wealth? A lot of people would say, money. It's not. Money is just a representation of wealth. Money is an artificial construct that human beings invented in order to make exchange of goods easier to do. Why? Because if two people go down to the river, one has wheat, one has wool, and the one with the wool is hungry and the one with the wheat is cold, that's great, that works. What happens if someone goes down to the river and has lumber? It doesn't help. So we invented the concept of money. But that's not what wealth is. Wealth, according to Marx, is the use value of all commodities enhanced by the universal value of labor. Great formula, but it's wrong. Because the use value of commodities is an ever-changing thing. And in fact, the universal application of labor is a nonsense. Because that's not how products go to market. That's not how new technologies are developed. So if you view the value of labor as a universal, there's no way for you to use pricing as a mechanism, which means in order for the system to work, you've got to have standardized universal pricing, and then what happens? That closed system doesn't create wealth at all. Because this is what wealth is. Wealth, stay with me on this one, wealth is the delta between the amount of resources and labor necessary for subsistence and everything else. That everything else, that's wealth. It's an open-ended system. So where Karl Marx talked about, oh, the capitalists, they take a commodity, they turn it into money, and then they turn it into another commodity, and then they take a profit from it, and they do it at the exploitation of the... It's wrong. It isn't CMC or MCM. It's CM, 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 ad infinitum forever because it's an open system. Why? Because technology is what always creates wealth. So Marxism isn't the solution. 
And the difference between Marxism and socialism is that Marx looked at socialism, and here's the definition of socialism. Socialism is the public ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. That's it. Simple formula. Marx looked at that formula and he said, who's going to agree to that? Nobody. So we'll have to enforce it politically. You cannot have Marxism without totalitarianism. Now think about that for a minute. By definition, any enforced utopia becomes a dystopia by definition. So Marxism doesn't work for that reason, and socialism doesn't work because it also misunderstands the nature of wealth. Well, what about democratic socialism? That's an interesting idea. In fact, it isn't socialism at all. Demo what we call democratic socialism in this country is not socialism at all. What it is, it's a recognition, recognition of the limits of markets. Markets do a lot of things well. Anything to do with commerce, markets do well. We should leave the markets alone. They self-correct. Because that natural equilibrium between supply and demand is regulated by pricing, it works. Hands off, generally speaking. But there are some things that markets don't do efficiently. So if you have something that everybody needs, you can't rely on the market. Why? Because there might not be a relationship. There might not be a correlation between your ability to pay and your need. That's when we defer to the collective. That's why we have roads and highways and bridges and tunnels. Some of them are tolls, most of them are not. Most of our infrastructure is not. We have private schools, but most people go to public schools because everybody needs education. Why? Because they are universally required, so you defer to the collective instead of the market because the market doesn't do it efficiently. That's not socialism at all. But people call it democratic socialism. Why? Because they use the tax system as a way of raising the money necessary to do those things. It's an interesting concept. Thomas Piketty, any of you read Thomas Piketty's book? It's a bestseller. Old school socialism. Now, was his formula R over G brilliant? Yes, the rate of return almost inevitably is higher than the growth rate, but not universally. And the probability is that stagnant wages had more to do with that formula than anything else. So Piketty doesn't have it, right? So all of these utopian solutions fail at the first hurdle. Folks, we don't need a utopian solution. What we need is to fix what we have. But we can't do it without God, in my opinion. I don't believe we can do it without God because God invented economics. God, in the very opening of the Bible, is involved in economic activity because God is the worker par excellence. And all economics start with work. You take what God has given you, you use your skill and dexterity and mind and creativity to make it into something that allows human beings to flourish. I'm going to give you a little piece of information that you may have to use on a trivia quiz sometime. But there is more in the Bible about faith, work, and economics than there is about heaven, hell, and sexual ethics combined much more. God cares about wealth. God cares about how we create it. God cares about what we do with it. And God cares about the relationship between individuals and communities. So in the Old Testament, oh my goodness, I could go on and on. From the prophets to the Levitical codes, I could go on and on and give you example of example of example where God warns people against excess wealth and forbids the exploitation of anyone, including foreigners and freed slaves, those who are downtrodden. The Old Testament is full of examples of how we should do economics. We should do it in a way that promotes human 
flourishing. And more importantly, we should do it in a way that reflects the nature and the character of God. That's how you're supposed to do economics if you're a Bible-believing person. In the New Testament, Jesus just picks up on it, doesn't he? Although Jesus, frankly, gave more warnings. Why? Because the economics of empire were very different from the, the economics of an agricultural semi-nomadic society where the Old Testament was primarily written. So in the Bible, when Jesus is hard on the rich, it's because the rich were presumed to be collaborators with the empire. But more importantly, he warns against the corruption of the heart that comes from putting wealth where God should be. And that is what we've done as a culture. We have elevated wealth and power to a place that should be preserved only for God. And even good old Adam Smith warned against that. Why? Because Adam Smith read the Bible. And Jesus and James and Paul, who says greed is idolatry, they don't condemn wealth. Jesus was fine to hang out with Joseph of Arimathea. He was fine to hang out with Zacchaeus. He was fine to hang out with the rich. Uh, you know, no problem. But if someone came to him and wealth was an idol, he didn't have good news for them. And I believe in the United States of America today, wealth has become an idol that is displacing God. That's why we have to redeem it. So I could go on, I won't, about the centuries of Christian tradition from Augustine to Aquinas to Luther and Calvin. We would not have capitalism were it not for Calvin, folks, because Calvin rewrote the rules on benevolent usury, which is what freed capital for investment. And then when we had the Industrial Revolution, bingo, we had the mechanism to create wealth and capitalism was born. Without Calvin, you never have capitalism. Kind of interesting. But you know what? He would roll over in his grave if he saw what we do with usury today in this culture. Because you know what Calvin said about usury? The primary ethic should be the double love command. If someone has need, do not lend the money, give it to them. If you're lending money to someone, ensure that their potential gain is greater than your potential gain as the lender and never lend at interest rates that the world decides, lend at interest rates that are proper to the circumstance based on the double love command. What we do today, allowing payday loans at 4,000% interest, what we allow today with credit cards with astronomical amounts of interest, it's shocking. But that's postmodern capitalism. And the fact of the matter is, throughout history, we were warned about this. But here's the thing. We have the tools to address it. We have wisdom, okay? We are thinking people. God in the Bible has given us wisdom. And the biblical definition of wisdom, the Hebrew definition of chokmah, isn't like the Greek understanding of wisdom. It isn't phrenesis, okay? It isn't techne. It isn't isolated based on what you're doing. Chokmah means that observation and participation always go together. So in other words, if we want to change capitalism, we've got to actually do it, not just talk about it or think about it. We have the ability to do that because we have the wisdom in the Bible that teaches us how to do it. We also have common grace. This isn't just for Christians. I just wrote a chapter in a book the handbook, the Routledge handbook on business ethics. And I was asked to write the chapter on all the global religions and business ethics. You know what I found? There is a commonality among all religious traditions when it comes to business ethics in terms of honesty and integrity and concern for those who are less off, etc. So this is not a parochial exercise. It's not like all oh, those Christians are coming at us with some idea about capitalism. Even non-believers by virtue of common grace, know in their heart of hearts that the system is broken. And that's why they're grasping at straws. And the utopian solutions are exactly that. They are straws. But most of all, we have virtue. We have virtue. 
and the virtues that everyone, before this book was written, everyone who wrote about economics and virtue always wrote about the cardinal virtues, the Aristotelian virtues that Thomas Aquinas baptized for us of prudence, justice, courage, and temperance. They are universal. That's why people are happy to talk about them. Who doesn't want prudence? There's no prudence in our economic system today. None, zero. You know why? Because prudence is knowing what to want and what not to want. And if we've been told what we should want is to make as much money as possible, then we don't have prudence. We don't have justice. How can we have economic justice if 99% of the wealth is in the hands of 1% of the people? That's not economic justice. And there are reasons, intrinsic reasons, in the way we put money into the system through debt vehicles that increases that disproportionate amount of wealth. We shouldn't stand for it. I'm not talking about egalitarianism, but I'm talking about justice. And what we've done is we've created a system which is infinitely unjust and I unpack it in the book. We have courage. We should have the courage to say we aren't going to put up with it because courage is opposing anything that opposes virtue itself. And last is temperance. Who talks about temperance anymore? No one. What's the mantra today? I want it all. I want it now. You've all heard it. I want it all. That's not temperance. You know what temperance is? Temperance is control of our own appetites. That's all temperance is. Enough's enough, folks. Enough is enough. And this treadmill that we're on of more, 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 which is reinforced by messaging every day on television and in magazines, and we've got to stand up to it, folks, because it's going to turn on us and the system's going to collapse. But the most important virtues and I'll end with this, are the so-called theological virtues. You know why? Because they're just as universal as the cardinal virtues. We call them theological because we ascribe their source to God. But I can promise you, you cannot have capitalism without faith. Just reach into your pocket, pull out a piece of paper, which is nothing more objectively than a piece of paper, but you believe it's good for the goods and services that you want to buy. That's a purely faith-based system, fiat money. There's no gold behind it. There's no silver behind it. It's a fiat system. That's faith. And we can't have capitalism without hope. Why? Because no one would invest their hard-earned assets without a hope of return. But as Christians, our hope is that by being capitalists who practice it in a Christian way, is that all of society will flourish. All of society will flourish. And the last and most important virtue, I want you to think long and hard about this, is love. Because love is missing from postmodern capitalism. When I say love, I'm not talking about that mawkish emotion that you read on greeting cards. The biblical definition of love is given to us in a symbol more than words. That symbol is the cross, where the one who had everything gave it all up for those who had nothing. Imagine an economic system based on faith, hope, and love. Thank you.